Thank you for your generous giving for the church van in Cambodia. And your giving was um, exceeding what uh, the van cost uh, is. And so I'm very thankful and we'll be able to do more things with that um, excess uh, money for the Lord's glory in Cambodia. Thank you. Our year 2023 theme is to put on Christ Jesus, and the main text is the one we just read uh, this morning. We started out to look into the passage in January and then diverted to different texts. And the last one was uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. This detour was necessary because we must know the reason why we need to put on Christ if we have to put on Christ. To know the reasons, we have to understand our present condition that necessitates, that causes for us to put on Christ. We have studied God's creation of mankind. We also studied about the image of God, the fall of Adam and Eve, and original sin. Let me briefly recapitulate the lessons we have learned so far. Genesis chapter 3 is the story referred to as, fall, as the fall, a fall from what was meant to be expressed more generally in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, as a human condition. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is the great graphic picture of, um, of, um, of the fall. There is a whole cluster of symbols around this central expression of being fallen. So there are different expressions you could find to describe or express or explain the fallen state of mankind. For example, Genesis chapter 6, Jeremiah 17, humanity is fully corrupt and stained or blemished in Psalm 51, lost or strayed, Psalm 119, 176, or Isaiah 53, and captive or servile, Romans 7, Galatians 5, and deadness of men, Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2, and the man is the blind. Uh, Luke chapter 4 and John 9. All these expressions simply show us a deficient or distorted identity and resultant behavior compared with what was originally given by God. We are less than what we could be or should be. That's why we need to put on Christ. Today, we will continue to study about putting on Christ. So I may, I'm may, i afraid that I'm not going to go into uh, Romans passage either um, today, but rather in order to get into chapter 13, um, Romans chapter 13, I need to deliver this one more message um, for your better understanding of the topic. The first point we need to consider is this. The fallen state of man requires him to put on Christ. Man fell into sin through Adam. This fallen state is often referred to in the Christian tradition as the original sin. This can be somewhat misleading because our creation as images of God is more original than original sin. We could not be thought of as fallen if there were not some standard or expectation from which we have descended. Even psychotherapies and spiritual practices aimed at healing, integrity, and wholeness assume that there is an original goodness that can be recovered. So from that standard, somehow man has been fallen. So there are different kinds of spiritual activities or, or psychotherapies given. We would expect that after such psychotherapies, a person would be less violent, less hurtful, more peaceful and compassionate. Even when we fall below society's standards, the assumption is that that is not our true or better self. A more original and good self is trying to come out. In Christian theology, this is understood as the image being marred but not lost completely after the fall. Knowing ourselves as fallen alerts us to our true selves from which our hearts and actions have been corrupted. It sets us 
on a search for healing in relation to other people, to the wider communities, and to God. The image of God or his likeness implies that, as J.I. Packer says in his book, uh, um, in his writing, uh, Reflected Glory, in quote, we should always act with resourceful rationality and wise love, making and executing praiseworthy plans just as God did in creation. He generated value by producing what was truly good, so should we. We should be showing love and goodwill toward all other persons as God did when he blessed Adam and Eve. And in fellowship with God, we should directly honor and obey him by the way we, we manage and care for that bit of the created order that he gives us to look after according to his dominion mandate, end of quote. However, fallen man is certainly not as fully like God as he was before. He fell from the standard of God. How did the fall affect these personal characteristics? The Genesis narrative shows us how. There are a few points we need to consider. Starting with intelligence, man was still a thinking and speaking being even after the fall. So that intelligence part was not completely lost, but something was now wrong. He did not think or speak the truth. Adam and Eve both deflected blame through rationalization, a hallmark of intellectual depravity. In chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, to rationalize is to provide a plausible but untrue reasons or motives for a course of conduct that is coming from Webster's third uh, New International Dictionary. So when people began to uh, rationalize for their wrongs, they are trying to find uh, some uh, wrong motives to justify what they're uh, doing. As for volition, man retained the power of thoughtful choice, but his bent was now toward the wrong choices. Morally speaking, fallen man remained responsible for the moral choices he made, but he lost the moral goodness of his character, so he could not but make wrong choices morally. And spiritually, sinful man cut himself off from face-to-face -face personal communion with God. Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. That's why he is dead spiritually. Furthermore, he forfeited the uninterrupted enjoyment of eternal life in fellowship with God. That's why he has to go through the state of deadness. Nevertheless, his soul remained immortal after the fall, and though fallen, he is redeemable. That's why Savior was provided for us. Besides the image itself, the important corollaries of rules and relationships were affected by the fall as well. So ruling a cursed and uncooperative of creation was now to toilsome and truly futile. That's why we oftentimes see the natural disasters. Even I think yesterday somewhere, there was some um, Morocco, there was an earthquake and so lots of people were killed. And sometimes uh, when these natural disasters are happening, people are questioning the existence of God. But in fact, biblically speaking, natural disasters is a proof of the existence of God and the fallen state of man. Bearing children was now painful. Men still sought relationships in marriage and society, but they were now marred by sin. The fall affected the entire man, body and soul. So his body dies, returning to the dust whence it came. Thus the body, that vehicle by which man is to function on this earth in God's image, suffers the corrupting effects of sin. As for man's soul, the personal qualities that liken him to God formerly remain, but they are twisted and corrupt in their operation. Anthony Huekmar distinguishes between the structural and functional aspects of the image of God. I thought that is quite interesting. Structurally, he said, fallen man still possesses the gifts and capacities with which God has endowed him. But functionally, he now uses these gifts in sinful and disobedient ways. Thus, the believer's renewal in God's image enables him to once again use his God-reflecting gifts in such a way 
as to image of God properly. So a distinction has to be drawn here. We still bear the image of God formerly. That means we still have in us the abilities that if rightly harnessed would achieve a fully righteous God-like life and so the unique dignity of each human being must still be recognized and respected as a gesture of honor to our maker. That's why all men are equal before God. We do not discriminate anybody because of races, because of ages, because of sexes. Every one of the individuals created by, by God has God's image, and that gives the value and worthy, worth of those individuals and of, of our value, um, it is um, given through God's image in us. But we have lost the image substantially. And it takes God's grace gift of union with Christ to restore it fully. So as a result, we became unable. We do have such a valuable thing within us, image of God, because, of its, because it is marred we became unable to, do be, to, to be right and good. Through this gift, we share his resurrection life in regeneration, sanctification, and glorification, and it comes only through Jesus Christ. Fallen man now uses the dull and damaged tools of his heart and mind to serve himself and the devil instead of God. He goes astray from the womb, according to Psalm 58, verse 3. His heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9. His mind and conscience are corrupted, Titus 1, 15. He is a darkened in understanding, excluded from the life of God, ignorant and hard-hearted, Ephesians 4, 18. He is foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved to lusts and pleasures, Titus 3, 3. Yes, the image of God in man remains, still remains in the fall, after, after the fall, but it is badly marred and it is in need of a renewer in Christ. Like Adam and Eve and everyone else save Jesus, we fail here constantly, however, good intentions as believers. And so, to a high degree, do all unbelievers who being under the power of the anti-God force, Paul calls sin, lack good intentions. That does not mean, of course, that they are all as bad as they could be. It simply means that sin in the human system, our legacy from Adam, drives us all the time to be self-centered and self-seeking, and so robs us of the power to love God with all our heart and mind and strength. That's why the fallen man is required of putting on Christ and renewed. The secondly, putting on Christ is the renewer of the image of God. And so we have heard of this you know, phrase, putting on Christ, putting on Christ. But what does it really mean? Well, putting on Christ is the same as the renewer of the image of God. Putting on Christ is about the renewer of the image of God in fallen man. God made man in his image after his likeness. We were created in his image. Then how is the image of God related to Jesus Christ? Well, it is because Jesus is the express image of his person. Here is a very difficult verse. Hebrews 1, 3. I want you to read this, book, uh, this, uh, this uh, verse. Hebrews 1, 3. Hebrews 1, 3. Let's read it. Who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen. So, Jesus Christ is the brightness of his glory, God's glory, and the express image of his person. Does he mean express image of his person? It's a Godhead, God's per, God person. 
the phrase the express image of his person is really difficult to understand. So if you look at ESV translation, it says the exact imprint of his nature, exact imprint of God's nature. The NASB says the exact representation of God's nature, his nature. NIV says exact representation of his being. In other words, what these translations are trying to portray is that Jesus is God. That's what he's saying. The Greek word for image in Hebrews 1.3 is actually character, which is used only once in the New Testament. So when the image of God, the image is translated in, I mean, it is written in Greek uh, text. Uh, there is another word, akon. But uh, interestingly enough, here the image is coming from another Greek word. Oftentimes it has to be translated as character. You know, English word the character must have come from, from this word. It is, it is um, a different, normally used um, Greek word for image, which is akon. Lou and Nida's Greek lexicon defines the Greek word for his person, his person as in quote, the essential or basic nature of an entity, substance, nature, essence, real being. ESV, ESV and NASB says nature, his person is translated as his nature, and NIV says being, so his being. Thus, the express image of his person means who is the exact representation of his real being, or he, who is the exact representation of his, his nature. In some languages, there is no ready lexical equivalent of a real being or nature. So I do not know how Korean and, and um, Chinese languages sh could um, uh, express it fully as we can find in, in English language. Therefore, we may express this concept in Hebrews 1.3 as who is just like what he really is. That is the meaning of it. Who is Jesus Christ is just like what God really is. That's the meaning of it. Thus, Jesus is the very image of God. Jesus is the word made flesh, and his glory is the glory of the only begotten of the Father, John 1.14. The incarnate Son, whom Paul hails as the Father's true image, Christ, being the image of God, means actually living this way moment by moment and day by day. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So here, Christ is being expressed, described as the image of God. Colossians 1.15, who Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Whoever has seen Jesus also has seen the Father, John 14.9. All whom God foreknew, called, and justified are also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ, Romans 8.29. Thus, the ultimate end of the biblical anthropology is that man is conformed to the image of Christ. Having considered a few verses so far, we cannot but to conclude that putting on Christ is ultimately the same as being conformed to the image of Christ. To be conformed to the image of Christ is not different from being conformed to the image of God because Christ is the very image of God. Putting on Christ and putting on new man are closely related because sometimes the Bible says putting on Christ and there is also an expression that we must put on Christ. Uh, we must have a new, put on with a new man, putting on new man. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24 says, would you like to read that verse? Ephesians 4, 24. When I sent out emails, I asked you to read the verse. 
before you come. I hope that you read the context as well. Ephesians 4.24, let's read it. And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen. There are not too many passages in, in the scriptures talking about the image of God. Um, what is really image of God? And this is one of those passages. And another one is um, Colossians 3, verse 10. So, and that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Compare it with other translations. Here, ESV says, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God. So there is a difference between King James and ESV. ESV, uh, King James says, just after God. But ESV says, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. NASB uh, says, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in, the, in righteousness and holiness of the truth. In this case, NASB puts the likeness of in italics, which shows that it is not really in the original, but it makes sense if we have it here. NIV says, and to put on the new self, created to be like God, to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. If we read them carefully, all translations imply that we must put on new man, which is created after the likeness of God or the image of God. So new man is the final product, which is created after the likeness of God or the image of God. Thus, putting on Christ means to be conformed to the image of Christ, which refers to putting on the new man which is the one created after the likeness or the image of God. It means that the most important matter in Christian anthropology, once again, concerns that God created a man in his own image and the likeness. And it is something that needs to be fully restored because it is marred, which can be done only in Christ Jesus. What is endowed to man in creation by God is according to Ephesians 4.24, righteousness and holiness. It must take an integral part of the image of God. Precisely, they are the missing parts from the modern man, righteousness and holiness. It gives us an awesome thought that eventually to understand that it is the will of God toward us, which is our sanctification. It is because in the image of God, when God created us, God created us in righteousness and holiness. Therefore, sinful Christians, sinful Christians, wicked Christians, those two words do not match. The image of God carries righteousness and holiness. Therefore, when a person believes in Jesus Christ, his sins are forgiven, and he is putting on Christ Jesus, then he becomes the followers of God. So he, he cannot but reflect the nature of God, attributes of God. To understand this passage better, we need to look into its parallel passages in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. So why don't you turn your Bibles to Colossians 3.10. These two verses, I'm going to have some comparative studies continually. Colossians 3. Ten, let's read it. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Amen. While Ephesians 4.24 says that man is created simply after God. That's what Ephesians passage says. Man is created after God. Colossians 3.10 says man is created after the image of God. Very clearly. Therefore, after God in Ephesians chapter 4 must mean the same thing as after the image of God in Colossians 3.10. While the image of God is said of righteousness and holiness in Ephesians 4, in Colossians chapter 3, Paul says of the image of God in relation to knowledge. This knowledge is none other than the knowledge of God. There is something more that we need to learn from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20, 24. 
The last two words of the verse are true holiness. True holiness. If I literally translate Greek words for these two English words, I would say holiness of the truth. That's literal translation. Holiness of the truth. If we take them as holiness of the truth, then it refers to holiness that the truth produces or the truth has. True holiness could mean holiness which is based on the truth or originated from truth. In other words, holiness cannot be separated from the truth. With this understanding, we go back to the Colossian passage, then we'll know that the knowledge after the image of God includes righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. So these are the components. In the first place, in the image of God, God is when God made us according to his image. Then as Charles Hodge says, in quote, nothing therefore can be more contrary to scripture than to undervalue divine truth and to regard doctrines as matters pertaining merely to the speculative understanding. Righteousness and holiness, morality and religion are the products of the truth without which they cannot exist, end of quote. That must charge, that must challenge a lot of professing believers who claim to be the believers of the Bible. It is because the Bible is the truth of God. And if the truth of God truly is, is truly believed and practiced in somebody's life, then that person must be able to demonstrate righteousness and truth in his personal life. Truth cannot but produce holiness and righteousness. So it is something that I shared um, with the people on, on Wednesday night. In fact, uh, you know, a few days ago, and I have visited a lot of, you know, Bible-believing and fundamental churches, and uh, all of them are quite militant. We are fundamentalists. We believe in God's word, and the doctrines are important. But in, in, but interesting thing is that their reputations around them are not that very good, and usually. Very fundamental churches believing in, in the scriptures are known as unloving and cold churches. They are extremely ready to fight against the doctrinal, you know, the you know, the falsehood or a wrong doctrine, wrong teachings, etc. But in their personal life, as a person character, they are not so commendable. That is not right. The holiness must rest on the truth, and the truth must be able to produce holiness and righteousness. Putting on Christ or being renewed in the image of God is about our righteousness, holiness, and the knowledge of God. Righteous and holy living do matter to God. And the lastly, putting on Christ results in holiness. Now we are going to expand our thoughts a little bit more. Ephesians 4.24 says, And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We are progressively transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus. Its display is well explained in 2 Corinthians 3.18, which says, But we all, with open face, beholding us as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Thus, the substantial image is renewed when we believe in Jesus. So I need to explain to you about, about this a little bit more. First of all, God's work of renewing the image starts in the hearts. With inward illumination, our embrace of Christ and motivational change is at the core of our being when we are regenerated. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. The light is shone through in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
And Second uh, Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All the things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Therefore, there is a, there is a difference between before and after our conversion. Before Christ comes into our heart, and after He comes into our heart, we are different. Our inclinations are reoriented to fulfill the most important commandments of God. That's why, if you are really serious believers of Christ Jesus, you become more sensitive of sinful things in your life. That's why you may feel more, even more guilt feelings in you, and you may sometimes want to condemn yourselves. Why am I sinning? And uh, why am I getting so bad and worse and worse? And what's wrong with me? I have been believing in Jesus Christ, and I want to please him. I want to uh, give him honor and glory. But why am I? Who am I? Um, and and uh, what, they are struggling. It is a very extremely natural thing. It is because the light is shown through the hearts of the believers. So the more they are careful, um, observant, I mean, they become a careful observant of themselves, then careful observers of themselves, they cannot but see all those spots of wrongs and errors and so on. So the more you trust in God, the more you become followers of Christ Jesus, the more your conscience is going to attack you of your wrongs. So that is extremely normal. However, that should not lead you to your self-condemnation, but rather you should be brought to Christ Jesus with even more thanksgiving. Even though you are so terrible and um, not so good people like that, but Christ died for you, then must give you more reasons to praise him. Our inclinations are reoriented once after we are converted. Born-again believers want God more than they want anything else. In daily life, our strongest desire is to love and worship, serve and please, and honor and glorify the Lord. Ephesians 5.1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. 1 Thessalonians 1.6 says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And also, we find ourselves wanting to do good to others every way we can. And most of all, to share with others our knowledge of new life with God in Christ Jesus. Thus, all our duty becomes all our delight at the deepest level. And from our new motivation comes that imitation of, of God and of Christ. That is every Christian's calling. It is precisely expressing the image of God in daily life. True image of God in Christ-like action starts with a Christ-like motivation of the regenerate, spirit-indwelt heart. Believers both experience and demonstrate their renewed image of God. Paul states it clearly in three passages. The first two speak of the believer's present experience. And uh, one is uh, the verse we just read, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Paul describes the glorious salvation which believers in Christ uh, possess. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This passage is quite interesting if you know the background. What Israel enjoyed under the, under the old covenant was glorious, but this glory was not as glorious as what believers in Christ now have. That's the, the explanation in verses 7 to 11 in chapter 3, 2 Corinthians. Yet Jews refused to accept this truth. Their minds are hardened and a veil lies over their hearts, keeping them from believing Christ, verses 14 to 15. But when someone does turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away in verse 16. It can only be removed in Christ Jesus in verse 14. Paul continues to use the metaphor of the veil in verse 18, the same chapter, to explain the glorious transformation that believers in Christ experience. While Moses was veiled and the people of Israel could not see the glory of God in his face, 
We who are in Christ gaze with unveiled faces directly into God's glory. Son of God was born. And we behold the Son of God. Whoever has seen the Son has seen the Father. This wonderful privilege has been afforded us by Christ and the Spirit. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And meanwhile, the Spirit is transforming us into the image of the Lord from one stage of glory to another. The wonder of salvation in Christ is the sanctifying work of the Spirit who is transforming us into the very image of Christ. Here, however, Paul does not define the image of God, and he does not tell us in what way we are being transformed into it. In Colossians 3.10, Paul does get more specific. He exhorts the believers in this chapter to live in the light of who they are in Christ. The reason we are to put off all the sinful passions and behaviors Paul lists in the chapter is that when we got saved, we put off the old man with his deeds, our deeds or practices, and put on the new man. Paul uses two participles here to picture completed action. In fact, um, in chapter 3, verse 10, there are three parti uh, participles. And, um, and these participles are all in past tense. I need to um, tell you about these grammatical points, especially tenses, it is because um, different tenses do carry different ideas and different implications we can find from those teachings. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul used the participles while Paul used in Ephesians all infinitives, but exactly in the same tense, a past tense. Paul uses two participles here to picture in Colossians chapter 3.10, Picture completed action, past tense. At the time of conversion, the believer put off the old man, past tense, and put on the new man, past tense. It's a done deal. We become new creatures. We are not becoming a new creature every day. But at the time of conversion, the spirit came into our hearts and we are regenerated. We are justified. We became new creatures. So we have put off the old man and put on the new man. There are other expressions meaning the same thing. For example, in the same chapter, chapter uh, uh, 3, uh, verse 3, Paul described this as having died and then having our life hidden with Christ in God. And, and uh, in chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, um, here, Paul says that we are buried with Christ. It's like we are dead to our old man. We are buried with Christ and raised up with him from spiritual death to life, put on the new man. So even though expressions are different, but these are meaning the same thing. Similarly, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul describes conversion as death to sin. So put off the old man. The crucifixion of the old man with Christ and the deliverance from the slavery of sin is found in Romans 6, 6. So returning to Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul uses a present participle. I told you before, two acts, put off and put on, past tense. But here is a present tense. And the present tense in Greek contains or implies an ongoing process. It's like a present progressive. So it is not just a present tense, you know, I go. But in Greek sense, it must be understood as I am going. So with that idea, you see Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. And so Paul uses a present participle to describe an ongoing process of renewal in the life of the believer. In other words, a believer is renewing must be done continually and continually. It talks about sanctification.
It's an ongoing thing, continual action. As a new man, the believer is continually being renewed. So once after we are putting on Christ Jesus, putting on Christ must imply a truth that it must be a continual action by following his will, obeying his commandments, and we are being renewed. So as a new man, the believer is continually being renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Colossians 3.10. Three things are notable about this clause. Um, chapter 3, verse 10. Number one, it is impossible to miss the allusion to Genesis 1.27 in reference to the creator's image because the verse says that we are created after his image. The image of God in view here, Paul is talking about, is not an image of God in every man, but in particular, he's talking about the image of God in the believers who have put on Christ to Jesus, who have put on the new man. Number two, the believer is continually undergoing a renewer in relation to image of God. Therefore, Christian must continue to grow in Christ Jesus. It is con Christian's maturity is not an overnight when Christian um, or person believes in Jesus Christ. Christian must be continually renewed and reformed. Paul says that the believer is being renewed to knowledge. In what sense is the believer being renewed to knowledge? According to F.F. F. Bruce, the believer is gaining nothing less than the knowledge of God in Christ, the highest knowledge to which human beings can aspire. Being renewed to the knowledge of God is more than just attaining information about him, so getting more knowledge about Christian doctrines, although that is certainly part of it. But more importantly, this renewal entails the transformation of the believer's character into that which mirrors the very character of God. So the more you know the scriptures, the more you should be imitators of Christ. Can you imagine that here is a man who knows the scriptures back and forth. He can memorize a lot of scripture verses and he has studied Christian doctrines so much, but his heart is not right with God. His life is not reflecting God's character. Then how fearful person that person could be and would be. This is why Paul stresses the new attitudes, new passions, new behaviors of the believer throughout this passage. So we are not saved by our works. We are not saved by the law, but by faith. But once after we believe in Jesus Christ, we desire to keep his laws. We are not saved by changing our lifestyle from bad to, to good. But in fact, even if we were bad, when we believe in Jesus Christ and we became new people, then we cannot but change our lifestyles, the manners of life. To come to know God in Christ is essentially to come to be like him in our character and conduct. Maximilian Zerwick said, in quote, Paul speaks here of a knowledge resulting in likeness to its object, which is God, end of quote. It refers to believers' sanctification. We put on Christ. We are conformed to the image of Christ. We are renewed in holiness, righteousness, and knowledge, and we become like Christ. Sanctification is the will of God. While Paul does not use the, use the term image, akon, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24, he does speak of the believers putting off the old man and putting on the new man and of the new man's renewer, just as he did in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul's exaltation in Ephesians 4 is the same as in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. In other words, Live in the light of who you are in Christ. Show your identity in your character and living. Not by just your lip confession. Paul challenges the believers to walk in a new way and not in the way of unbelievers. Ephesians 4.17 Who greedily practice every kind of impurity because they have given themselves over to sensuality. In verse 18. But this is not the way of the believer. Who has put off the old man and has put on the new man. 
Just as he did in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul uses the same tenses, past tense, like in Colossians, but in this case, infinitives, to describe decisive and completed activity. So at conversion, believers are to put off the old man and put on the new man. Earlier, Paul described the conversion experience as being made alive together with Christ and created in Christ Jesus for good works. And now we return to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, when Paul refers to the ongoing renewal of the believers, he does so with a present infinity. It means that we are taught in Christ Jesus to be renewed continually. Do you remember present tense? Implies the progressive idea, continual action implied. So we, are, we have put on Christ Jesus. However, we do, not, we do not stop there. There has to be a continual action in our lives. So it means that we are taught in Christ Jesus to be renewed continually in the spirit of lowliness, meekness, patience, and tolerance, and love, as the same chapter, verse 2, teaches. The renewed ones demonstrate the truthfulness, honest work, wholesome and edifying speech, and kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness toward others. So even if you do not say that you are a Christian, you are working in your workplaces, wherever you go, you know, basically you meet the strangers. However, people cannot but notice that something is different in you. They may not know that you are a Christian. However, they know that something is different. Paul seems to imply the image of God in verse 24. We talked about it before. Ephesians 4.24, there is no word for image. The new man which the believer has put on has been created in the likeness of God in, the, in righteousness and holiness of the truth. The first part of this phrase actually just reads, after God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, you, you read it and you say, you cannot but say that there is, no word for image, but it says after God. Uh, after God literally means according to God. The clear parallel between this passage in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, where, where Paul referred to our renewer as after the image of God. We cannot but say that Paul has God's image or likeness in view here as well. So that's why some translations uh, added those words, image or likeness in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, even though it is not in the, in the original text. God's goal for believers is that they become new creations in the areas of righteousness and holiness. So Bible teaches us about justification. Justification is necessary for our salvation. We need to be justified. We need to be declared to be righteous before God. And that justification must be obtained only by and through the blood of Jesus Christ. However, there is more than that for the believers, which is a sanctification. Combining what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3.10 with what he says here in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 F.F. F. Bruce summarizes the goal of divine renewer of the believer as follows. In quote, the knowledge of God is never divorced from walking in his ways. To know him is to be like him. Righteous as he is righteous, holy as he is holy. End of quote. The knowledge of God leads us to holiness and righteousness. What we have seen in Colossians chapter 3 verse 10 and Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 is that the believer's present experience of renewal to the image of God concerns the attainment of true knowledge, not just the accumulation of information about God, but transformation of his or her life to conformity with the very character of God. So the knowledge of God must lead us to the character of God. And the character of God 
must be demonstrated and displayed within us. This centers on exhibiting in our life in an ever-increasing way the communicable divine attributes of righteousness and holiness. So, so many times in the scriptures, the Lord says, as God is holy, the believer is to be holy in all his behavior. 1 Peter 1.15. As God is righteous, the believer is to display righteousness in every sphere, sphere of his life. 1 John, Ephesians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, etc. The fall caused the distortion, though not demolition, of this respect of the image of God in man. The fall did not demolish this aspect of image because all men have some knowledge of God and his will for man via uh, general revelation like the nature and God justly condemns them for suppressing it. Romans 1, 18 to 32. Yet this respect of the image is certainly distorted because lost mankind does not know God personally which requires salvation only through Christ Jesus. Man's sin has separated him from God. He's without God in the world, and he cannot please God with his life. That's why man must come to Christ Jesus. Only in Christ can this image of God in man be restored. This occurs as the believer, with the aid of the Spirit, aligns his thoughts words and deeds on a daily basis to the standard of God's righteousness righteousness and holiness as delineated in the scriptures. The renewal of the believer to the image of God is simply progressive sanctification, the process by which the believer conforms himself more and more to the communicable attributes of God like love and holiness and righteousness. In this way, the believer is enabled to be properly directed toward God, others, and the entire creation. That's what Anthony Hokma says. This leads us to the finer stage, finer passage that speaks of the believer's renewer in the image of God, which is in Romans 8.29. Would you like to turn your Bibles to Romans 8? <coughs> 29. Let's read it together. For whom did he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen. God's goal for the believers eventually here is, is a, a wonderful teaching of um, God's plan of salvation. In fact, if you look at verse 30, it says, Moreover, whom he predestinated, them he also called, and whom, and whom he ca called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So that's, a, that's a, a different stages or different expressions of um, um, of. Um, God's way of salvation, how God calls him, God, how God uh, brings uh, individuals to himself. And the final stage, final goal, what is the reason God saved his people? What is the reason God calls his people to be saved? God's goal for believers is that they be like his son. God predestined believers to become conformed to the image of his son. It cannot be attained by our mentor exercises only. Of course, that mentor exercise must be done and so that our hearts will be you know, moved according to the work of those you know, mentor exercises within us by the Holy Spirit, and eventually every one of those things must be come out. And when they are coming out, they are in conformity to the character of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are to be conformed to the image of his son. The process is already underway through the progressive sanctification, and God will complete it in glory. For those God calls and justifies, he also glorifies. In the similar vein, 
Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The goal of our salvation is glory, and of our salvation is glory. Glorification marks the completion of our salvation, and complete salvation means a full and final conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through salvation, believers can do, can and do experience renewal to the image of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Renewal in Christ transforms the character and conduct of the believer to match his righteous and holy God. Present renewal to the image of God is simply progressive, progressive sanctification. We may not be able to attain to the perfection in this life. However, we will be improved continually. We are going to be better and better, continually sanctified. We are not going to dwell in sins in the past, but we will be better and better. And we will be able to display Christ-likeness uh, more and more. God will complete the process in glory. In that day, all our thoughts, words, and deeds will finally please God in every way we enjoy complete conformity to Christ in body and soul. As those created in God's image and conformed to the image of his son, we will finally be what he wants us to be and do what he wants us to do perfectly and forever. That will be the glory indeed. Until then, we'll strive to be holy for God is holy because God is holy. Putting on Christ is completed only when we are conformed to his image. Putting on Christ means simply this. Be like him. Christ likeness. And so that's the main teaching we can find from Romans chapter 13. The main key passage we will eventually have to study. Christ likeness. Putting on Christ. Putting on new man. Or be conformed to the image of Christ. All of them are interchangeably used in a quite similar way. And uh, all of them simply mean that we must be like Christ. Do you have the desire to be like Christ? Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we have gone through some difficult passages of the scriptures. However, we have found that at the time of conversion, we have put off our old man and put on the new man. And once after... We are converted. The putting on Christ is shown to us through continual work and actions within us to be imitators of Christ Jesus. Father, we desire to be the imitators of Christ. We desire to be the followers of Christ Jesus. We want to become like a Christ. The Christ, Christ likeness is our spiritual goal, dear Lord. Help us to obey your commands and help us to obey your will and help us to mortify the sinful lusts in our bodies, but help us to dwell on the things of God in the above. Lord, help us to be like a Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.